Hi, my name is Peter Walker. I'm a counselor and clinical supervisor. I want to reflect today on uh, maybe one of the greatest struggles um, for man in this life um, regarding temptation, um, lust, uh, coveting of that which we do not have. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, the great writer uh, and uh, apologetic of the 20th century, um, he once uh, uh, referred to how he as a professor would sometimes deal with a struggle of temptation and lust in his role as a professor. Um, he said one of the greatest uh, vulnerabilities of mankind is uh, when they are experiencing any kind of admiration and in a professor role you often have people deferring to you as a leader and they may be admiring and uh, this was his career and he said that uh, one way he uh, dealt with this uh, temptation when he found himself caught up maybe uh, uh, thinking and uh, in a, uh, a tempting situation or, or what he described as a lusting a lustful situation he said he would sometimes remove himself intellectually and in, and and begin to ponder the actual dynamics of lust itself um, the mystery that it is um, as 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 a struggle and a temptation so he said sometimes he would uh, try to get off track of a direct struggle in temptation by thinking on temptation and lust itself. Um, also thinking of his position, I think of that quote by Nietzsche uh, from his uh, book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He said, if there were gods, how could I endure not to be a god? Therefore, there are no gods. Uh, it is in the heart of man to desire worship and to be like God, not to acknowledge God, but to be a god. Uh, hence the temptation of the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, referred to in the book of Genesis uh, where the serpent spoke to Eve and said you will become like gods uh, if you eat of this fruit. Um, infatuation, uh, that word is almost automatic pick in its intensity. Uh, infatuation, uh, it can grip a man and um, and it is that kind of intense working of desire and focus and everything in your being tells you that to possess and to consummate this desire would be to attain to a sense of lasting fulfillment itself. Uh, when one is caught up in an infatuation with someone, um, it almost feels like uh, it's worth your very soul. Uh, in exchange for this experience. Um, one, one, uh, one thing uh, to ponder about this, there, there, there's, there's so many aspects of this and, and, and you may be on, uh, on different points of this spectrum perhaps, maybe you've bought in to, to something and maybe um, gone down a relationship road or broken a relationship that you wish you had not. Uh, there's principles in this, I encourage you to stick with this just for a couple minutes, no, nothing is lost. If you continue to breathe, and you can and you can watch and listen, then uh, then there's hope for you. Um, uh, I think of that scripture: a bruised reed, he will not break, and a smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. And if you if you live to listen, uh, then you're you are but a bruised reed. And the Lord has redemption power, full redemption, Psalm 137, full redemption, no matter what point of the spectrum you're on. Um, but I want to just ponder briefly this dynamic of, of lustfulness and coveting. Exodus 20 speaks of the Ten Commandments, and there's two that are related in this field. Verse 14 uh, says flatly, do not commit adultery. Uh, verse 17 speaks of not coveting things you don't have, and it includes your neighbor's wife, uh, which seems to relate to committing adultery, but it, it, it can begin with a coveting, a desire. Here's an interesting dynamic. If we go the C.S. Lewis route of, of 
tackling some of this pressure by considering the dynamics of the pressure. Here's an interesting one. Why is it that we desire what we don't have intensely, but we lose desire for, or that which we do have seems to lose or lack luster? And yet, that which we have can be the subject, or the object rather, of someone else's intense infatuation and desire. How come something can lack luster for me, which I have, but be an object of great desire for someone else? The same way the reverse is true. You may have an intense infatuation for someone else who is the possession, as it were, of another, and they lack interest in that same person for whom you have great desire. Why? Why does it seem to work in the opposite direction simply for that which we don't have? Could it be that one of the key principles at work, and therefore a key to keen insight on the nature of this issue, is that which we do not have being a compelling factor? Not the object itself, but the very principle of being denied something. And so it, could it be that there's something in us that craves that which we do not have, hence the commandment, uh, Exodus 20, 17, to not go with that desire because it's not truth. There is a prompting and a compulsion to have what we do not have and become that which we are not, namely God himself. That drive is at the core of lust and um, covetousness in that sense. And because of that symmetry, others wanting what you have and you wanting what others have, we can see it's false. We can see it's an equation of not being satisfied with our lot and wanting that which we do not have. Now that should also tell us that that road is false because at what point will you have everything? So supposing you, you breach this contract, you take that which is not yours, what happens? Well, it becomes yours, and now that which is not yours lay beyond that, and on and on ad infinitum. Um, okay, I want, to, uh, 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 I want to also just speak to uh, those of us maybe who have gone too far and maybe um, broken down relationships, bought into the lie, and now wonder if there's any road of redemption uh, for us. And I'd just like to speak again, just referencing what I just said. If that's the case, uh, truth of God is, is, is like a river. You can jump into it at any point. If you, uh, if you are living and breathing, you can jump in that river at any point, at which point he will begin to work the hurricane of redemption in your life story, backwards, forwards, uh, beyond the bounds of this life. I think of the, the, the man who turned to Jesus who was being crucified with him and he turned to him and he said, I deserve to be hanging here. Uh, we don't go into the details of why, but he says, I deserve to be hanging here. He turns to Jesus, cries out to Jesus and says, remember me. And Jesus says, I'll remember you. This day you will be with me in paradise. There is redemption. With him is unfailing love, backwards, coursing through the present to the future and full redemption psalm 137 it is not too late no matter at what point you are in this story of broken relationships of buying into the lie of continuing to desire the lie um, the lord works outside of circumstances and the first thing and the most important thing is to bend the knee to acknowledge that you are not god to acknowledge your sin and your wrongdoing and ask god to to remember you this day and he will begin a work that will eventually completely change the color of your decisions and your course. Isaiah 118, God says, let me give you some of my rationale. And it is this, though your sins are like crimson, they shall be white as snow. Uh, God wants to work that gift into your soul, into your relationships. Um, so it's not too late. It begins calling on his name.